All right, we'll uh, get started. Can you guys hear me okay? Good? All right, well, great. And uh, well, welcome back to uh, school, everybody. It's fall quarter, start of a new year, and uh, week zero. Everyone's full of optimism and joy, and, uh, and only to continue throughout the rest of the year, right? Um, everyone, everyone here is a senior, is that right? No? Who's not a senior? Oh, wow. We got a lot of non seniors. Okay. But, uh, but that's okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm happy to have all of you guys uh, as students. So, um, all right. Well, this is uh, Stats 102A, Introduction to Computational Statistics with R. And, uh, and I'll be your, uh, your teacher, Miles Chen. And, uh, and I see uh, a lot of familiar faces and, uh, and a lot of new ones also. Um, well, we'll start, let's start by uh, going through the uh, syllabus and we'll talk a little bit about the course and then we'll talk about um, some of the content here, okay? All right, so here we are. Um, let's see, let's make this a little larger. So this class is Introduction to Computational Statistics with R. The kind of the big picture of the class is that, um, I don't know, it's introduction to this idea of computational statistics, but the course is kind of split into two parts, all right? The first half is going to focus mostly on the tools, specifically R and some of its packages, and then the second half of the course will get into some of the methods of computational statistics, and I'll I'll get into that uh, a little bit later in uh, in today's uh, lecture. Um, I'm coming with the assumption that everyone has already taken Stats 20. Is that correct? Did anyone not take Stats 20? Okay, so everybody's taken Stats 20. So you guys all have the the basics of R down, and so you know in the first half of the course we're still going to cover more R, a little bit more. Um, maybe a little bit deeper in terms of the, uh, the programming uh, requirements and, and what you will be doing, okay? Getting into some of the nitty gritty details of functions and syntax and all of that, okay? Um, and then the, the second half, we'll, we'll look at some of the methods here. Okay, my office hours are Mondays and Fridays from uh, 1 to 1.50, so, um, so basically I teach this class at 2 and at 3, and so basically, from 1 to 1.50, I'll have office hours. And my office is in uh, MS 8105, Math Science 8105. Uh, um, I'll try to keep that door open. I'll try to have it propped open. But if for whatever reason someone kicks the door jam out or something, it's not open, you can uh, call my office phone number, and then I'll come by and, uh, and open the door. Um, you can also uh, email me for an appointment if these times don't work out for you. But pretty much I'm on campus only Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, okay? So all of my teaching is on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And so I'm not, uh, I don't, I don't live extremely far, but it is a little bit of a commute, so I don't come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, okay, uh, course website, CCLE, and, uh, and the grades are on my UCLA. I think you guys already know that. Um, oh, well, if not all of you are seniors, is anybody, is this like your first quarter ever at UCLA? Anybody? First quarter ever at UCLA? No, okay, all right. I was, I was hopeful for like some transfer students, but but that's okay. Well, I guess if the requirement is that you have stats 20, then then it's not going to happen that way, huh? Okay, all right. Just all right, uh, we'll have a midterm on November 3rd, Friday, and then we'll have the final exam during our scheduled exam time. Okay, so for you guys, it's December 12th, Tuesday. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. Lecture 1 is at 3 and lecture 2 is at 2, but um, that's how we have. Okay, you guys have uh, our studio. You guys should have covered that in Stats 20, so, so that's that. All right, we've got a few books that we'll be using, okay? Um, I was able to find uh, 
all the books that we'll use are all um, freely available to you guys. All right, so being a student at UCLA, um, you, the UCLA library subscribes to several online libraries and, um, and I was able to find the content that I want on, uh, on freely available books. Uh, well, the 102B class, I couldn't find everything I wanted in free books, so I had to request a book that needs purchasing. But, um, but anyway, so you just uh, click these links and you can um, download the PDFs of each chapter that you need. Okay, so, um, so that's good. I'm, I'm a huge fan of eBooks. If you really want a physical book, you can spend your money and buy the uh, the physical book, and um, and you know we'll just cover a few chapters from from each of these texts. Um, do you guys know about Safari Books Online? ProQuest Safari Books Online. Oh man, that's like a such a great resource. Um, these books you can't download the PDFs. You have to read them in your browser. But um, the entire O'Reilly catalog. So O'Reilly are like these programming books where they put like an animal on the cover. Um, they're, they're really good books and pretty much the entire O'Reilly catalog is available for you at Safari Books Online. And you just have to be connected to the UCLA network. So while you're here and you connect to UCLA Wi-Fi or whatever it is, um, you'll get these books for free. If you go home and you don't live on campus, then you have to connect via the VPN, and um, and you can access those books for free. Okay, and that that's as long as you have you know your UCLA Bruin Online uh, account. When you after you graduate, you lose that um, you lose that feature. Okay, you also get like subs like uh, access to tons of journals and stuff. It's really amazing. Like. Um, if you're not at the university, journals are like crazy expensive, okay? Like you want one article, it's like $40 for just one article, but but while you're at UCLA, it's everything's free. It's, it's, um, it's pretty great. So uh, anyway, um, if you don't have the VPN, just type in UCLA VPN into Google and uh, it'll be the first hit, or um, I've got the link right here. Okay, as far as our grading goes, we'll have uh, homework, a midterm, uh, and a final, and uh, and some attendance. Okay. As far as homework goes, we've got six assignments. Uh, each of them will be worth eight percent, and none of the assignments are dropped. So make sure you do uh, do each of them, and then um, and then we get the midterm and final. Uh, those will both be kind of in class and handwritten uh, tests. And then uh, I'll take class attendance on some arbitrary days, okay? Not today, but um, but I'll, I'll take uh, attendance, and uh, and we might do attendance the old-fashioned way where I kind of call your name, or um, there's like a tool called online poll, but it may or may not work, so we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, as far as the homework goes, um, I post the homework assignment as a R Markdown file, and I think you guys are all familiar with R Markdown, right? Okay, so I'll post it as an R Markdown file, you'll download it, and then you will complete the assignment. Then you render it as an HTML document, and you'll upload the HTML onto a CCLE. So don't, don't upload your R, uh, R Markdown file, but upload the, um, the HTML, okay? The, um, as far as uh, late policy goes for homework, um, there's a 10 minute grace period, okay? So generally I'll try to make the homeworks due around 6 p.m. And so if you turn it in at 6, 10, 59, uh, no penalty, okay? But one second later at 6, 11, you will get a five point penalty. Don't email me and say like, oh, I turned it in at 6, 11, 02. Um, can I avoid the five point penalty? I'm gonna say no, it was actually due at six o'clock and your assignment's due, your assignment's 11 minutes late. But you know, you do have to have some kind of grace period cut off there, okay? Um, and then every hour after that, you lose um, five more points. So at, uh, you know, the, the points just uh, tick. But I am a firm believer that, uh, that you need to get sleep. So 
I have no penalties between midnight and 8 a.m. Okay, so um, so even if you're a little bit behind, make sure you get some sleep. It's it's important for your health, and uh, and so so get sleep. So no penalties for for sleeping. Okay, just uh, the the points resume at uh, at nine o'clock there. Okay, the the point penalties, I guess. All right, and then uh, you know, so whenever I post a homework assignment, you just just don't do something silly like, you know, I thought the assignment was due on Thursday, but it was actually due on Wednesday or something like that. Okay, because if you turn it in twenty four hours late, that's that's a huge loss of points there. So um, so don't do something uh, silly like that. Um, just when you see a homework assignment being posted. Uh, look at the due date and mark that due date somewhere in your calendar, right? Just and uh, well, you should start working on the homework immediately. But I know that's that's just the ideal ideal scenario that doesn't always happen. But make sure you uh, you mark it in your calendar so you don't have a don't make a silly mistake of turning it in on the wrong day. Okay. Uh, I understand that sometimes life happens and things things come up, and so so I do have. Um, Policies for homework extensions or make it exams if uh, if uh, something prevents you from from get submitting the assignment or taking the exam. Uh, but basically, I just need documentation if you're asking for some kind of uh, uh, you know if you're if you're giving me a reason. I mean, I just need documentation. Unfortunately, I can't just I can no longer take students just purely at their word. Um, so just. Just some kind of paperwork backing it up. That's all. Okay, and then and also for attendance, if you want your attendance point to be excused, just documentation, right? Okay. Um, academic integrity. Um, do your own homework, okay, and um, and be honest. Don't copy other people's stuff. Don't go online just and download some past homework assignment that was posted or something like that. Okay. Uh, you're not going to learn that way, and uh, you know you're you're cheating yourself out of a, a yeah learning experience, and um, and you're trading away your integrity and, and honesty there. So uh, so it's it's not worth it. You know it's just a few points in your grade. Um, that in the grand scheme of things, it's 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 not not a huge deal. So uh, so do that. Okay. Um, Gender discrimination, sexual violence, and harassment. I mean, um, treat everyone with respect, right? We want to be treated with respect. You should treat other people with respect. Um, and so, you know, do unto others uh, is uh, is kind of the golden rule there. And um, but you know, if uh, if you find a, yourself being a victim or you know just not being respected in, in uh, the way you should be. Uh, the campus does have resources available um, to to kind of help you help you through that, and um, and the same also goes for uh, mental health issues and student wellness. Uh, the campus does have resources available uh, for anybody um, going through any kind of difficulties. So, you know, um, being in your third or fourth year of university now, um, I'm sure you've experienced some of the. Um, the joys and the sorrows of uh, of life and on uh, and being at school, and um, but you know overall, the school does want you to succeed. We want students to graduate and flourish and do well and you know do great, accomplish great things after uh, after graduation. And so, uh, the university does have a lot of resources uh, available uh, for you. Um, you know whether. Um, you're a victim of sexual violence or um, have uh, issues with mental health or anything like that. Okay, if um, I'm sure if well, not sure. I'm not sure, but um, but you know, and if you have any kind of disability, um, this the campus has the uh, Center for Accessible Education (CAE), which um, you are probably familiar with. And so, if uh, if you need accommodations, um, you can always uh, contact them. Okay. This is a tentative outline of topics that we will cover in the course, and um, so this is kind of what what I'm hoping to uh, to get through. Uh, we'll, you know, if we need to make adjustments, we'll make adjustments. But uh, but I think we can we can.
can get through all of this stuff here. Okay, are there any uh, questions before we get started? Good. Okay. Then, um, then we'll take a look. Uh, so I have today's lecture posted here. Uh, this will be a RMD file, okay? And you'll you can download it and open it in uh, our studio if you want. Um, and if not, then um, you don't have to. <laughs> no one's going to force you to do anything, okay? And then uh, and uh, and we'll we'll go through here, okay? So. All right, so here, here we go, okay. We'll start um, here, and uh, okay, and, and I think I've posted all of this in the syllabus, but, um, but welcome, welcome to this class. And, uh, and if, you'll, uh, if you'll forgive me, I have this cheesy thing to say, but, um, but you know, this is my commitment to you as your teacher. Um, you guys are the paying customer, and, uh, and it's my goal that you are completely satisfied with the course and with, uh, with the instruction that I provide. And, uh, and in return, I hope you guys give me high reviews at the end of the quarter. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I want you guys to have a positive learning experience in this class. Um, I hope you guys feel like you learn things uh, so that it's not just, you know, you get a grade at the end, but that you actually learn things along the way. Um, and in this class, it's in the context of computational statistics, and I, and I hope these will all be things that will be useful to you uh, in your future. Uh, and I personally love the subject of statistics, and I love teaching. I feel like this is my dream job, and, uh, and so I hope uh, to give you a little bit of passion and joy uh, for, for this subject of statistics. And if you're a stats major or a stats minor, I'm, you know, I'm always trying to promote the uh, the major and minor. Um, it's a it's a good choice. Okay, so okay, and in return, I um, I want you guys to uh, to let me know if there are things that I can improve uh, for the course. Okay, come uh, come see me and uh, have a chat. Um, you know, um, and I also expect you guys to put forth a good faith effort. For the uh, the topics that we cover in the class, okay, um, and you know some of the homework assignments are intended to be challenging, and I expect you guys to wrestle through them, and uh, and I don't want you to just give give up uh, at the first sign of resistance. I don't want you guys to just turn to your uh, your neighbor and say, you know, how did you do this? Let me just copy or let me see what you did here, okay? Um, you know, try to think through it uh, to the uh, to the best of your uh, ability. Okay. Of course, you. I, I know students talk to each other about the homework assignments, and that's fine. But I just don't want you guys copying each other's code and stuff. Um, I have linked a TED talk on CCLE on having a growth mindset. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this concept, but um, you know, as far as education goes, there's kind of some theories about the. The attitudes and mindset that we have towards um, education, and um, and we have there's the fixed mindset and there's the growth mindset. Okay, and the fixed mindset is kind of the idea that um, you know people are naturally talented in certain abilities, and uh, and so you know you know they they do well and. You know, when they do well, that's because they're winners, and when they do bad, it's because they're losers. And, you know, for whatever it is that, uh, that they're dealing with. Okay, that's having a fixed mindset. Whereas a growth mindset kind of says, you know, if I do well, that's great, and if I do poorly, it's because you know I'm just getting started, and and uh, and I have to put forth some effort and and learn, and and I will get better. Okay, and Scientifically, it shows that you, our brains do have this um, what's called neuroplasticity, and it's an ability to form new connections and uh, you know um, develop new skills uh, with with practice and training. And so, um, so you know, nobody is born a 
good programmer, you know, sh straight out of the womb, no one, no one can program, right? Uh, it's something that everybody has to learn, and and it might feel that you know you look at your neighbors and you go like, wow, that person is already doing excellent stuff coding, and here I am, I'm struggling to write a, a loop. Okay, um, don't feel bad. Okay, it just means you just need a little bit more work. Okay, um, and. And, and that's what we have, right? As I believe, you know, as long as you're enjoying it and having some fun, um, keep going at it, okay? Don't, uh, don't give up. Uh, so anyway, you can watch this video on having a growth mindset. It's about 10 minutes long. I, I, think it's, I think it's really good. Every time I watch it, I'm like, man, I'm going to go out and learn how to play piano or something. I'm not really, I, I actually don't really have a desire to play piano, but, um, <laughs> but I feel like, oh, wow, I can learn something but it's everything requires time right and that's like the precious resource of all of human history um, so so anyway I, I want you guys to wrestle through the difficult topics and uh, and develop those things okay all right let's get started let's let's indeed okay so what is this class about all right It's a statistics class, and so in the big picture of things, we, we can ask, why do we bother studying statistics? And my answer to that, and this is kind of the answer I give in the intro class, intro, like stats 10, is that we study statistics to gain a better understanding of the world. And, and because this class is still a statistics class, I'm going to still use that answer and say statistics, we study you taking this class to gain a better understanding of the world. And, uh, and effectively, statistics allows us to take data and make meaningful conclusions from it. And that's kind of what we will be doing in this class as well. We've got to learn some tools along the way, but we will um, look at data and try to make meaningful conclusions about it. And so um, when we look at data, we, we're asking the question, what does this data tell me about the world? All right? And, and in your intro class, you learned how to summarize data. You learned about the center and the spread and the shape of the data. And eventually, we tied it in with probability, and you did hypothesis tests, right? And the hypothesis test, you have effectively the question you're asking is, could the data I have be a result of random chance, a random fluke, or does it actually indicate something special is happening right and so um, so for example if you did a hypothesis test perhaps you had a set of data and maybe you start off with the null hypothesis that the data is coming from a population and the population has a mean value of 10 okay, whatever it is we're talking about we got a set of data your null hypothesis says this data is coming from a population with a mean value of 10 Okay, well, according to the rules of probability and the central limit theorem, we're, that, that tells us that when we take a random set of data from a population with a mean of 10, then that random sample of data should also have a sample mean of 10 or something close to it. Okay, when we look at our sample of data, maybe it has a mean of 11.3. Okay, and so now we are faced with this question. Is this a value of 11.3, is that what we might say significantly different from the value of 10? Okay, and, and to answer that, we calculate a p-value, and maybe it turns out that if we're counting on random chance only to be our source of variation, maybe it says that it's very unlikely to produce a random sample with a mean of 11.3. Okay, and in that case, if it's if it has a very low probability or a very small p-value to get 11.3, then we say, you know, we're going to come to the conclusion that the population does not have a mean of 10, okay, or something like that. Okay? I'm hoping this sounds kind of familiar from your Stats 10 intro class. Yeah? Okay. Um, so all of that... That hypothesis test and your confidence intervals and all of that, that was based on the math in the central limit theorem. 
Okay, so the central limit theorem is kind of the mathematical theory that says you take random samples, those random samples will have a sampling distribution that looks like the normal distribution. And, and that's probably a result that you have to uh, prove or at least demonstrate in uh, your mathematical statistics class 100B. You have to probably do a, a proof there. And, um, and yeah, and, and you can do a lot of great, excuse me, uh, a lot of great statistics just with that um, mathematical principle of the central limit, central limit theorem. Okay. However, there are instances where the math involved in the problem get really complicated. Okay. So maybe it's not just taking random values out of the population. Maybe it's, you know, in this scenario, we're going to do this, and if in this other case, we're going to do this, and if this other thing happens, then this happens. And maybe the math um, gets really complicated, and we don't have a simple analytic or closed form approach to answering our question. Okay, So what do we do in, um, in cases where the analytic approach is too complex or or possibly even impossible, okay? And in those cases, we might be able to use computationally intensive methods, okay? And so this is kind of uh, a brute force way of answering our question. We can just run hundreds of simulations and see what happens. Uh, we can uh, do all sorts of different things that will help us uh, gain some insight to, to these things. So. You know, in um, it's going to be uh, the baseball season is winding down. It's going to be the playoffs pretty soon, okay? And it's like uh, there's going to be like the World Series, and the Dodgers um, are doing well. I'm a, I'm a Dodgers fan, I guess. And you guys are Giants fans. <laughs> um, anyway, you know. People ask, you know, what's the chance of this some team, you know, winning the World Series or at least making it to the World Series or this and that. And um, there's not a formula that you just throw, put in um, some number and it spits out the answer, okay? But uh, one way to answer it is via simulation, okay? And, um, and you can simulate games of baseball. Uh, putting in some of the, the player statistics and things like that to try to get an idea. Um, and you can model this after thousands of scenarios and see, uh, see what happens. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what computational statistics is about, um, at least in a, from a broad perspective. And, uh, and this gets further explored a little bit later in 102C and, and other things. But... Um, but that's kind of where we're, we're headed, is trying to answer some difficult questions that may not be, we don't have an analytic or mathematical answer to those things. OK, so I think I said this already. We're going to first cover some of the tools of computational statistics, and then we will um, introduce some of the methods here. OK. And, um, all right, so this is what we'll cover, floating point arithmetic. So, yeah, root finding simulation, okay. Um, okay, R markdown. R markdown, I think we've already, you guys already told me that you're familiar with R markdown, so I'll skip over those slides. If you're not familiar with R markdown, just click this link for R markdown, and, um, and they have like get started and this is kind of like your introductory uh, lessons, okay? Watch those. And then, um, and if you're already familiar, but you just need a quick refresher, the cheat sheet kind of shows you all the things you need to know, such as making your headers and your block quotes and stuff like that. Okay, so I'll skip all of this getting started. Um, but. You just need R Markdown to submit your homeworks, okay? You're going to download the R Markdown file, render it, and then submit the rendered file online, okay? 
Oh, let me just say a little bit about when you submit your homeworks online, okay? There's about 70 of you in the class, and we have one person, one grader, grading all of your homeworks, okay? So that person is not going to spend more than 10 minutes on each assignment. So, in, so you keep that in mind, and the idea I'm trying to communicate to you is make sure that all of your answers and the work that you have done is completely is communicated clearly to the grader, okay? So your assignment might say, um, write, a, write some code that performs a task, right? And perhaps in your homework, you write the code, and if you run the code, it performs the task. But if you don't run the code in the R markdown file, and you just have a tech chunk of code where it's never run, and we have no idea what it does, it's, it's like impossible for the grader to grade that, okay? The only way the grader can actually evaluate that would then be to copy and paste that code into their own R and then make sure all of the, you know, variables and values and those, those things exist and, and run and, and see that out, okay? And that's just, it's not practical to ask the grader to do that for every single student. So make sure if the code says you know, write something, you know, if the problem says write some code that performs a task, make sure you demonstrate that you have performed that task in your uh, homework submission, okay? Don't add, don't add. Um, the reader's not going to try to, like, reevaluate your code or search for bugs or whatever, okay? So make sure it runs and, and it's clearly communicated that you did, that your code does what, it, what was asked of it, okay? Uh, I'll just put a reminder of that on CCLE as well. Okay, so we'll start um, getting into uh, our material here by talking about data structures in R. Okay, and I think you guys are familiar with some of this stuff, but we'll, um, I don't know, maybe get into a little bit deeper detail here. And uh, in your first homework assignment, uh, which I'll probably post sometime this weekend or on Monday, we'll, uh, we'll get, dig into this. Okay, so most of our data is either going to be one-dimensional or two-dimensional. So, okay, either you have a line of values, okay, in the one-dimensional sense, or you have a rectangle of values, the two-dimensional case. Okay, it's possible to have n-dimensional data. That's, that's also um, possible, but, um, but generally we got mostly one- or two-dimensional data. If it's one-dimensional, and we have the atomic vector, and we see the column heading for a homogeneous. Homogeneous means that the atomic vector, everything in that line of numbers or line of values, everything is of the same type. So if we've got numbers, everything's going to be a number in this atomic vector. If we've got character data, everything in the atomic vector is character data. Or if it's you know, logical values, everything's of the same type. Whereas if you're dealing with a list, you can have different types of data. You can mix characters with numbers and logical values. With two-dimensional data, you've got a similar type of setup. Matrices, everything in a matrix has to be the same type. You cannot mix character and numeric data in a matrix. But if you need to do that, you have the data frame. The data frame can mix types. Okay? We also have the array, which is uh, only exists for one, one data type. Okay, so we have six types of data in R, but we really only deal with four of them, okay? We've got the logical data type, which will be the true falses, your double, which is going to be um, your numbers, anything with a decimal in it, integers are numbers but no decimals, and characters are for anything with letters and stuff in there, okay? Complex is for like imaginary numbers and raw is for like hexadecimal memory codes and stuff if you need to look at um, stuff like that. But in general, this is what we have, okay? The function that we use to look at the type is, is going to be type of and that distinguishes this. We have mode which says numeric for both the double and integer, okay? Storage mode is kind of a, a legacy function from the days of S. Um, 
the S being kind of the predecessor for R in the days of Bell Labs when, so uh, back in the 60s, there was no Google, but there was Bell Labs, and that was kind of the forefront of technology. And they developed the programming language C and an S, which is the predecessor to R. Okay, atomic vectors are homogeneous. They must all be of the same type. That is, that's the case. Okay, so logical vectors, these are the Boolean values true or false. Okay, I suggest or I highly recommend typing um, the words true or false in all caps, okay? Because those are reserved words, okay? So if you, you have true, you got true, you got false, okay, those are, that's false. But um, R is pretty smart, and you can type in a capital T, and it's gonna recognize that as true, and you type in a capital F, it's also gonna recognize that as false, okay? And because of this, you know, you might get lazy and be like, oh, I can save myself three keystrokes by just typing in capital T, okay? But your laziness to save three keystrokes could possibly result in um, major problems if at some point in the future you decide to assign a value to the letter T, okay? So, you know, because you can have, you can store um, values in uh, you know objects and so now we've got the thing T and I know we haven't con covered control structures yet but if you have something like if T is equal to true or something like that um, and, and you say like print hello uh, working mistake um, it, it doesn't um, it doesn't run okay because because it's not it's not true, or if you just do if if t, it, this is not going to run. You've got to say if we've got true, then then it then it will run, okay? And that's the problem is because this t here is is a zero, okay? Whereas if you use the word true, you'll never make the mistake of assigning a value to true, okay? R is, true is a reserved word. You cannot overwrite the value of true in R, so. Um, so we'll do that, okay? And the same goes for false. So don't, um, so don't do that. Okay, we've got, um, and if you ask type of, this is gonna be a, a logical vector. And if you, uh, oops, combine values together, you got true and false and true. Okay, here's our vector there and you've got, um, type of a, that's a logical vector, okay? You got character data. Character data is indicated as such by having quotes around them. And if you have quotes, then it's character data. And you can use either single or double quotes, okay? But, um, but it's gonna get mad if you um, if you like try to mix mix types here, okay? So here I can have like, um, I can't do like a single quote on one side and a, um, it, it, it's expecting me to close it off here, okay? So, um, so don't, don't mix types in a single thing. So you should just, So there we have character data, okay? Type of B, that's gonna be character type, right? And, and it's, you can distinguish between, um, okay? So even though this is all caps true, because it's in quotes, it's not um, a logical thing, right? So type of, of D is character, whereas, um, a being uh, true and false, you can tell that it's logical because there's no quotes around that. Okay, so that's character data. All right, and then double anything, um, all of your numbers are pretty much double, okay? So if it has a decimal, it's most definitely double, okay? But it's also the default numeric type, so if you type in um, the number four here, it's gonna say double, or if you type in one, two, three, it's gonna say 
uh, double, okay? So there's no decimals there, but it still defaults to type double. If you want integers specifically, then you can use the capital letter L to indicate this is an integer, okay? So if you say 1L, then that is going to be type integer. So you got 1L, that's, um, it looks like just the number 1, but type of 1L is integer. Whereas if I type just the number 1, it looks the same, the output there, but type of, of the regular 1 is type double there, okay? If you use the colon uh, as shorthand for producing a bunch of numbers, like 1 colon 10 for 1 through 10, this is integer type, okay? So colon, so D 1 colon 3, this is integer type, whereas uh, if I do, if I combine 1, 2, and 3 together, even though they look the same, you can see D is integer type and F it says numeric, but it, you know it's double. Okay, so type of D is integer, type of F double. Okay, where D I was produced by one colon three and F I combined one, two, and three. Just some things to uh, keep in mind. Okay, so you know you combine things. When you combine, if you try to nest a atomic vector inside another atomic vector, it just flattens it out. Okay, there's no this thing and this thing up here, these are exactly the same. So there's no nesting of atomic vectors, it's just, it all gets stuck together, okay? You can test for types using type of, and if you want to test for a specific type, you can just do is.logical or is integer or whatever it might be, okay? And then is numeric will return true if it's logical or type double. All right, so a quick quiz here. Is dot integer three true false false? Okay, is dot integer three colon six is numeric three colon six true and is double three colon six false? Right? Okay, so yeah, true false true true false. Okay, hundred percent. All right, is atomic will return true if it's an atomic vector. Is dot vector will return true if it's any type of vector, whether it be a list or a vector, because a list is considered a generic vector as well. Okay. Coercion is a, so R is a dynamically typed language. You don't have to say variable x is going to be integer type, right? Like in C, you have to say define x integer or something, right? And and then if you try to stick in something that's not an integer there, it's going to get angry at you. Here it just says, you know, whatever x is, it's whatever it is. And so um, what it's going to do is if you mix together things of different types, because the rule for atomic vectors is that everything has to be of the same data type, it's going to coerce things to the same, um, same type. So if you mix uh, type double one and character hello, it's going to coerce the one into a character um, character value, okay, and then combine those two together. Here I've got a logical with an integer, and it's going to coerce the things into integer values and produce that. So false goes to zero, and uh, and then the, the integer one remains an integer one, okay. Here I've got a, a double, something with a decimal, and an integer one L. The integer gets coerced into type double. Okay, so we have that. The way the uh, coercion works is that it looks at the least restrictive form and coerces all of the objects into that form. Okay, so here I've got L for a logical vector, I for an integer, D for type double, and CH for some character data. Okay, why didn't I just call this C for character data? Why did I use CH? Everything else I have one, one letter. Okay, the reason why I didn't call this C is because C is a function that is very important and that's used to combine things to create vectors, right? It's kind of, you know, I'm using it right here to kind of create my vectors. So if I rename it, if I call something else 
C, it's not a reserved word. R will let you call things C, and it's not going to complain. But if you do that, then suddenly your very important combining function will break. Okay, so just keep that in mind when you're doing homeworks and you're like doing part A and part B and part C, don't call the, the function for part C, C, okay? Because if you do that, you're gonna break, break your code. Okay, so anyway, um, when I combine the logical, the integer, and the double, the double is the most, um, is the least restrictive type, okay? And so it's going to coerce everything into double. So we can see the true, false, true gets coerced into 101. Okay. Whereas if I combine the logical double and character, character is the least restrictive type. And so um, it coerces the true, false, true directly into character. Okay. So it doesn't convert this into 101 and then turn that into characters. It coerces it just it goes straight to true false true as characters there okay is that, is that okay everybody there all right and then you can um, force coercion yourself using um, the explicit function as dot numeric or as dot integer or as whatever and it's going to try to coerce things uh, into that data type um, if it can okay it's um, it does its best, and, and a lot of times it's successful, but um, but sometimes it's not. But so here, here I have a logical vector, false, false, true, and if I coerce it as numeric or as double or whatever, it's going to turn it into zero zero one. Okay, and so if I just run the function sum on the vector x that coercion into 001 happens automatically inside here when it gets run, and so it adds up these numbers, 0 plus 0 plus 1, and it returns 1, okay? Uh, or if I run the function mean on the ve logical vector x here, again, it coerces everything into zeros and ones, and it calculates the mean, and it returns 0.333. So this, in effect, turns it into the proportion that's true, okay? And so, that's a very useful thing because you can ask, um, I don't know, um, I'll say x is going to be round r unif um, 100 times 10, okay? So here, x, I have a whole bunch of numbers, right? Just produce a, a bunch of these things. How many of these are 4, okay? Well, I can do x is equal equal to 4, and this is going to produce a bunch of trues and falses. And I can say sum, and it coerces everything here into zeros and ones, and it says, oh, you've got 10, 10 that are 4, or if I say what's the mean, um, oops, it tells me that 10% of these values are the value 4, or something like that, okay? 9% or the value of 5. So it's it's a very handy function in terms of just being able to calculate the proportion of something if uh, if you just because we can do a logical test um, to say you know is something something and then uh, and we get we have a quick way to just get that proportion there. So that's a nice little thing here. Okay, it looks like we're going to run out of time here. Um, so we'll uh, we'll end here for now at uh, and I will uh, I'll see you guys on Monday. So have a great weekend, and I'm looking forward to a great quarter with you guys.